On this Sunday night, looking back while fighting forward, Americans remember a civil rights giant as fresh protests over racial injustice erupt across the country, sparking clashes with federal agents. That's not American. Plus, entering the bubble, NHL players move in to their new Canadian hub cities and get a first look at the pandemic precautions. And a Canadian celebrity offers a cash reward for a priceless teddy bear. Global National with Robin Gill. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. On the same day, Americans are memorializing one of the most important figures in the civil rights movement. Police are cracking down on protests in several American cities. In a moment, we will take you to the scene of Congressman John Lewis's final crossing over the infamous bridge in Alabama, the site of what became known as Bloody Sunday. But first, to the fierce face-offs across the U.S. as demonstrators clash with police. President Donald Trump's decision to deploy heavily armed federal agents to quell the protests appears to be having the opposite effect. Jennifer Johnson has our top story from Washington. Unrest in Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington overnight as protesters set fires and destroyed property. The Black Lives Matter march in Seattle started peacefully, but turned violent as demonstrators targeted the King County Youth Detention Center. Some used sledgehammers to shatter workers' cars. They slashed all four of my tires. They broke my back window out. You know, I, I, just, I just got out of work. I want to go home. Police and federal agents used pepper spray and tear gas against the demonstrators. Shots rang out. People can be heard screaming in the streets. In Portland, there have been daily protests against police brutality for two months after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Things had started to quiet down until U.S. President Donald Trump deployed federal agents to the city July 4th. It's horrible. Being tear gassed is horrible. It's painful. They mean it to be painful. President Trump claimed he sent the federal agents to these Democrat-dominated cities to maintain calm and protect the federal courthouse building in Portland. But their heavy-handed tactics have led to solidarity protests across the country. No, you can't have a call. No, you can't have a lawyer. We're just going to terrorize you, terrify you, intimidate the crowd so you don't come out and protest. That's not American. White House officials say federal agents aren't leaving Portland until these demonstrations calm down. We have federal agents there that are protecting a courthouse that actually have has not only been vandalized, but they're trying to burn it down. In many places, tensions are reaching the boiling point. Protesters wanting an end to racial injustice, opponents growing weary of the chaos. In Austin, one protester was shot to death. In Colorado, this car barreled through a group of demonstrators. Protests turned violent in Richmond, Virginia, too. Police in riot gear fired tear gas and rubber bullets to break up the crowd. Anger and frustration still spilling out onto America's streets long after Floyd's death was seen by the world. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. And those demonstrations are drawing plenty of comparisons to protests five decades ago. Back in March 1965, what became known as Bloody Sunday marked a turning point in the civil rights movement. Well, today, one of its leaders, John Lewis, was memorialized, and his funeral procession passed over the very same bridge where a peaceful march met a violent police crackdown. Lewis was nearly killed when a state trooper cracked open his skull with a billy club. And as Mike Armstrong explains, that image and Lewis's bravery helped to spark a racial reckoning. It has been called the final crossing. A civil rights legend, John Lewis, carried one last time across the bridge where he was almost killed. On that day, 55 years ago, it was a police officer's billy club that cracked Lewis's skull. On this day, Alabama state troopers lifted their hands to salute. The screams are one of the things that stand out when the stories of that day are told. March 7th, 1965, men and women marching for voting rights were met by police and civilians armed with clubs. 67 marchers were injured, about a quarter of them had to be hospitalized. That included one of the leaders, John Lewis. I was beaten by state trooper, knocked to the ground. What happened on this bridge wasn't the only time he was beaten. Getting into what Lewis called good trouble put him in danger often. 
In one incident, the man who beat him was identified, but Lewis refused to press charges. He said the struggle wasn't against one man, but against the system that produced that man. Well, one of Lewis's accomplishments was being part of the leadership that kept that struggle alive after another of its leaders was killed. We, we couldn't let the assassination of Dr. King stop the movement. Lewis would call this bridge hallowed ground and return often. For the 50th anniversary in 2015, he walked across with U.S. President Barack Obama. Even in March of this year, he took part in the anniversary while battling stage four pancreatic cancer. Now, the bridge crossing is only one in a week of tributes and ceremonies. Lewis's body will be moved to Washington for Monday and Tuesday, then to Georgia, his funerals in Atlanta Thursday. But another tribute may come later. That bridge he crossed is named after Edmund Pettus, a Confederate general from the Civil War who was also a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. There is a movement growing to rename it after John Lewis. Mike Armstrong, Global News. And back here at home now, where Canada's first black national news anchor has died. George Elroy Boyd passed away at a Montreal hospice on July 7th, but his death was only made public this weekend. Boyd made history as one of the original anchors on CBC News World. He was named co-host of the morning show on the 24-hour news channel in 1992. The Halifax native later left broadcasting to pursue his first love, writing. He went on to write for radio, television and theatre. Boyd was 68. And one of the world's most beloved movie stars, two-time Oscar winner Olivia de Havilland, has died. The actress is best known for her role in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, but she's also being remembered for taking on Hollywood, winning a major court case that imposed a seven-year limit on studio contracts. De Havilland died at her home in Paris. She was 104. And four-time Stanley Cup winner Eddie Shack has also died. Shaq was one of the league's most colorful players, both on and off the ice. He was known for his bruising style, distinctive skating gait, and larger-than-life personality. The Ontario native won four Stanley Cups with the Toronto Maple Leafs, including the franchise's last victory in 1967. Shaq was 83. And staying with hockey now, it is a big day for the NHL. Players and staff from 24 teams all entered their bubbles in Toronto and Edmonton. They will be back on the ice later this week for the restart of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Canadians are excited for hockey to resume, but as Mike Locatore explains, there are also significant public health risks at play. How secure is the NHL bubble? You couldn't even catch a glimpse of players arriving at one of their Toronto hotels Sunday. Fences fit for an international summit keep NHLers away from fans. But Yogita Sharma and her son are still excited. This is giving us a ray of hope that they are there, right? So it's giving us a hope that we'll be soon having the session, having the league started. If you wanted to connect with your favorite player, you had to be on social media to see teams making the journey the two bubble cities, Toronto and Edmonton. The Montreal Canadiens held a virtual send-off party for fans, while Vegas's William Carlson had more of a private goodbye with his pooch. Now, players could be away from home for up to two months, so it's no surprise they've packed everything, from guitars to video game consoles. A lot of video games and Netflix and FaceTiming with, with my dog. There have been jokes about playing in a bubble. This was posted by Habs forward Max Domi. But breaching it is serious, as some NBA players have been forced to quarantine for 10 days after leaving and returning. The NHL won't be allowing that. Leaving the bubble is, is just not something that we can tolerate. Uh, everybody's used terrific judgment to this point, and I know that we can count on everybody going forward. In Edmonton, the famous replica of the Stanley Cup is being polished outside a local sports store while members of the Nashville Predators enter their bubble. Having 12 teams in each hockey-hungry city could attract autograph seekers. And that's likely why the security fences have been installed. Infectious disease experts want fans to remember that just because hockey is back doesn't mean COVID-19 is gone. And we shouldn't be congregating 
uh, together, even if that means to see your favorite hockey player. So physical distancing, hand hygiene, putting a mask on when you're in an indoor environment. And a good reminder that if your team scores, you still can't high-five your friends, unless, of course, they're in your bubble. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. And of course, those strict rules for NHL teams are aimed at keeping both players and Canadians safe. There are now more than 113,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada. Nearly 9,000 Canadians have died. More than half of those deaths are in Quebec. And it has now been six months since Canada identified its first case of COVID-19. But as Mike Drolet explains, health experts are still debating the deadliness of the disease. Here are the latest numbers. The numbers have been adding up for months. Cases, tests, deaths, a puzzle of information epidemiologists have used to determine how deadly COVID-19 would be, even if we didn't have all the pieces. We won't know the true fatality of this disease until it's all said and done. Part of the problem is the numbers can be misleading. How is it that Belgium has the highest number of deaths per million in the world, almost four times that of Canada, while India, which has the third most cases, has so few deaths. It comes down to reporting. Belgium has a robust system in place, while India's is deeply flawed. I mean, I think the comparisons across countries can be problematic in the sense that, you know, nobody wants to be the worst performing country. And so there, there is potentially a desire to not necessarily count things very well and not be the country who has the most deaths. That reality has led to the raw numbers being interpreted in very different and politically motivated ways. It's a false narrative to take comfort in, in a lower rate of death. So epidemiologists like to point to the most accurate tool they have, the IFR, or infection fatality rate, which also considers asymptomatic cases. In January, the World Health Organization set COVID-19's IFR at 3.4%. A century ago, the Spanish flu was 2%. But with more information, COVID-19's IFR has decreased to the current estimate of 1%, which would still make it far deadlier than the flu. A different reality from what COVID deniers are pushing. People are saying that because they're blinded by their own ideology. So on its face, it's untrue. Look at the USA. A bad season of the flu in the USA kills about 60,000 people. That's a really bad season. They've already had over 130,000 COVID deaths. And it could get worse if the world fails to treat COVID-19 like the deadly disease it is. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Australia has just suffered its deadliest day of the pandemic. Ten people died in 24 hours in the state of Victoria, where new infections are surging, mainly in Melbourne. Seven of those deaths are linked to outbreaks in long-term care homes. And the British government has now removed Spain from the list of safe places to travel following another surge in cases and is warning that citizens who do choose to travel there will now be required to self-isolate for 14 days upon their return. And in North Korea, leader Kim Jong-un has declared an emergency and locked down a border town amid fears over what could be that country's first confirmed case of COVID-19. State media is reporting a person suspected of contracting the virus returned from South Korea. Up until now, North Korea has claimed that it was virus-free. Coming up, Hannah's aftermath. How hard did the first hurricane of the season hit the Lone Star State? Now, we'll take a look at this. The aftermath of Hannah roaring ashore in southern Texas. The Category 1 hurricane is now downgraded to a tropical depression tracking into northeastern Mexico. But at its peak, Hannah packed 150 kilometer an hour winds and sent punishing waves crashing into the coastline. A rescue crew actually had to pull three people from a sailboat sinking in a marina where they'd been trying to ride out the storm. Hannah may be weakening, but it's still drenching everything in its path and could drop as much as 450 millimeters of rain in some areas. Scientists are sounding the alarm over climate change and polar bears. For the first time, a new report led by Canadian researchers is putting a clear time frame on when certain polar bear populations are expected to collapse. Redmond Shannon has the details. For polar bears, sea ice is literally their platform for seal hunting. 
when they store up energy for a lean summer on dry land. But those summer fasts have been getting longer and longer, making survival more difficult. First scientific study on polar bears and climate change was published in 1993. We have known that they will be impacted. The thing that we didn't know is when they would be impacted. But now we have a better idea. A new study led by University of Toronto researchers is putting a timeline on polar bear survival. It says cubs will very likely struggle to survive in southern Hudson Bay within this decade. Other regions will follow soon after. And that's under an intermediate emission scenario. For a worst case scenario, the report says the demise of polar bears across almost all of the Arctic will be inevitable by the end of the century. The results weren't surprising, but it is nonetheless important and, and you know, I hope it emphasizes the urgency of the problem to now actually be able to put a timeline on these changes, just like we're putting timelines on sea ice changes and temperature changes. It comes as an international group of scientists say we are no longer able to hope for the best with those temperature changes. For four decades, scientists have said if and when carbon levels double from pre-industrial levels, the probable range of global warming would be 1.5 to 4.5 degrees. This new analysis narrows that to between about 2.6 and about 4.5 degrees. Basically, this study kind of provides a balanced opinion, like we're not doomed, but we also not should not be too careless because the Earth is going to warm um, in response to uh, emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. Anything under two degrees is deemed extremely unlikely if carbon dioxide doubles. Levels are currently 35% above any time since the Ice Age. When it comes to the future of polar bears and the planet, these results should only further focus minds of policymakers. The realities of climate change are approaching, and now we know more than ever what they will look like. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Slow the testing down, please. Still ahead, the former Republicans gearing up to take down Donald Trump. Welcome back. In 100 days, Americans will head to the polls to choose their next president. And Donald Trump is dealing with a growing opposition. Hard-hitting ads are springing up online and on television from an unlikely source, former Republican strategists. Eric Sorensen has more on the so-called Never Trumpers. There's mourning in America. And under the leadership of Donald Trump, our country is weaker and sicker and poorer. What sounds like a Democratic attack ad is not. Paid for by the Lincoln Project. Which the Lincoln Project. The These once high-level Republican operatives so. spent careers Decades. ambushing Democrats, oh, but in 2020 have turned their ruthless instincts on President hard. Trump. We fight very hard. Sometimes you might think we fight a little dirty, but... Something's wrong with Donald Trump. He's shaky, weak, trouble speaking, trouble walking. They are doing tougher ads against Trump than any Democratic group. They are brazen and articulate. He has eviscerated the norms of the American presidency. You sense the betrayal they feel. The job of the president is to protect the country. Donald Trump has been completely derelict in his duty. I guess they don't like me, but let me just tell you. These are losers from day one. If one aim of the Lincoln Project was to needle Donald Trump, it worked. They should call it the Losers Project. They use principled conservative appeals to, to try to denounce Trump, but I've never, I don't recall seeing anything quite so overt um, and organized as I'm seeing now. And there are others, like conservative thinker Bill Kristol. Uh, and unleash Trump in a second term. He also dreads a Trump re-election. I do think that's something I don't want to see. His group, Republican Voters Against Trump, relies on the power of raw testimonials from average Republicans. He consistently called the coronavirus a hoax. He's letting over 100,000 people die due to his incompetence. Josh from North Carolina voted for Trump four years ago. Not my proudest moment. I will not be voting for him again. Having voters in their own voice speak directly to the camera about why they've changed their mind mm -hmm. and letting other voters know that it's okay to do so. Those are powerful narratives. But will this campaign change the minds of staunch Trump supporters? They're certainly not going to persuade that base to, to change 
their voting behavior. But at the margins, it might matter a lot. And right now, American politics and elections are you know, decided by slim margins. Learn their names. With donations flooding in, the Lincoln Project has now turned its sights on Republican senators. And never, ever trust them again. Their expanded aim to remove from power completely Donald Trump and the party they once embraced. Eric Sorensen, Global News. Still ahead, why a Canadian celebrity is joining the desperate search for this beloved bear. Welcome back. This isn't just any ordinary teddy bear. It holds some of the precious last words spoken by a mother to her daughter, and now it's gone missing. Mara Soriano's mother, Marilyn, passed away from cancer last summer, but before her death, Marilyn recorded this message. As you can see, she put the recording in a custom-made teddy bear as a gift. But while Mara was moving to her apartment in Vancouver last week, the bag containing the cherished toy was stolen. Now she's pleading for its return. In the five minutes that I put it down and he unloaded the back of the U-Haul, this person had come in and taken the bag. She says, Mara, I love you. I'm so proud of you. I'll always be with you. And every time I missed her, I would hug that bear and I would listen to that recording. But Soriano is now getting some Hollywood help. Her plight caught the attention of Vancouver-born celebrity Ryan Reynolds, who tweeted Saturday that he'll give $5,000 to anyone who returns the bear to Mara, zero questions asked. Here's hoping for a happy ending. And that is Global National for this Sunday. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is Little Boschkung Lake in Ontario. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.